all, Hawk and Carlton at Carlton Carnivores here. You might notice I am in uh, my usual greenhouse right now, but by the time you see this, you'll probably, or will probably have moved to uh, the new location. So this will be the last video that you'll see of me in this little tiny space here. I've got a uh, special little species to share with you today. Uh, the third of the temperate butterworts that I've been lucky enough to have flower. And this is Pinguicula macroceros subspecies nortensis, the California horned butterwort. Now, whether or not that uh, common name actually fits it, up for debate, kind of your preference, but these are a very special little plant. Uh, this uh, subspecies only grows within the California Oregon border. So they like to grow in the same kind of environments that Darlingtonia californica, the California pitcher plant or cobra lily likes to grow. So these especially like to grow in those habitats that are more uh, rocky uh, in nature rather than the general seeps that Darlingtonia likes to live in. So these are more specialized in say like cliff faces and seepages. You'll find them uh, in some of those the areas are actually the rock cuts along uh, roads that have been built where water comes trickling down the sides and uh, these guys will grow within the cracks and crevices of the wall wherever that water is coming through. So the species as a whole is found throughout uh, much of the western coast North America, a little bit further inland as well. There are also some uh, individual populations that have been recorded in uh, eastern Russia and also in Japan. So kind of an interesting disjunct distribution that this uh, species has. And there's a little bit of debate about whether or not the species as a whole should actually be recognized as a species or if it should simply be considered a subspecies of sorts of Pinguicula vulgaris, the uh, more broadly distributed uh, northern temperate butterwort. But these guys are distinguished from that species primarily by the fact that they have a very long spur on their flowers, and we'll get to that structure a little bit more later, while uh, vulgaris has a much shorter spur. So. Uh, this species, the subspecies especially, tends to grow as a small rosette of sticky leaves uh, that usually only gets to about mm, two to four inches across, sometimes a little bit bigger, and in the wild, in strong light, this subspecies is also known for kind of blushing, this kind of yellowish to almost orangey red or brown coloration, very different from a lot of the other forms which tend to stay more green. You can see my plants here are fairly green because uh, I grow them indoors under general uh, fluorescent and LED lights. They don't get quite as strong as like full sun or a lot of UVB exposure that'll trigger some of those colors. So again, about two to four inches across and those leaves will kind of splay out across wherever these guys are growing, kind of anchor it against, uh, say, the rock walls or whatever seep it's growing on. And then, of course, all those little tiny glands that are on these leaves are what actually capture the insects that these guys eat. So small gnats, uh, flies, uh, and these guys actually also capture a lot of pollen that drifts down from other plants, especially pine trees, and they'll actually digest that too. The little tentacles will grab onto whatever's landed on there and hold onto it. The leaf will kind of dimple inward and forming a small like pool on the surface of the leaf and that's where the digestive fluids will kind of gather around whatever's captured and then process, digest uh, the protein, the nitrogens that's uh, within that. Now these guys are a northern temperate species so they grow as those nice green fleshy rosettes during summer but then as winter comes in all those leaves will start to die off and in the center of the plant it will produce a much more tightly bound uh, hibernaculum which is a structure composed of these really thick hard non-glandular leaves that kind of layer over each other so that they form this little kind of teardrop shaped bud in the center that's very hard very sharp and is built to withstand harsh conditions like the severe freezes that the environments these guys grow in experience every winter. So that will kind of sit a little further down in the soil, also protected from the elements blowing by. And at the base of those also, it will form miniature buds that are called gemme, similar to the gemme that uh, pygmy sundews produce, but a little bit different in origin. 
So pygmy gemmae are actually modified leaves. Uh, the gemmae of these guys are actually an entire mini structure that will become a whole new plant, so it's a mini hibernaculum. So during winter, these guys are covered by snow and ice and all that, and they stay asleep. They don't produce, they don't go through really any physiological processes during this time. They're waiting to, until spring comes, and once that happens, they wake up. Um, during winter, those little tiny gemmae around the base may get knocked loose and washed down uh, as the spring rains come into new locations, thus spreading the species around. And so, when spring comes, those hibernacula open up and start to release the first uh, new leaves that spread out again. Now, during uh, spring is also the time when these guys will produce their flowers. Now, I pulled these guys out of dormancy a little bit ago because uh, they've been uh, asleep in my fridge for far too long as I was waiting to get to repotting them. So, they are opening up just now and they're doing their stuff for me, but in nature, these guys will start to wake up depending on the location, anywhere from probably late March in through as late as mid to late June, they might wake up and start growing. And when they do, they will produce anywhere from one to maybe up to seven stalks that will grow anywhere from two to maybe six inches tall and produce each a single flower on top. As it develops, the flower stalk actually kind of bends over, so the flower technically is actually opening almost upside down. And it forms um, the uh, calyx, uh, holds the uh, developing flower as it's growing up, and then that kind of opens up and starts to release the actual uh, the corolla, the petals of the flower. Now in these guys, those petals are fused and formed into uh, the spur again, then that collects nectar at the back for pollinators. The corolla tube, which actually contains the reproductive structures inside, and then the two lips, which have uh, two and three lobes for the upper and lower lip, respectively. And on this subspecies, supposedly one of the traits that uh, separates it from the nominate subspecies, Macroceras, is that the lower lobe, the central, uh, or the lower lip, the central lobe, is a little bit longer and the outer lobes are a little bit more kind of obovate, kind of oblong shaped uh, compared to the normal one. And there's also a bunch of these little hairs that sit inside uh, right at the base of the palate there, right in front of the throat of the flower. So these open up, they're beautiful violet and white with darker highlights right around the throat. <clears throat> and those attract insects, maybe small bees or pollinating flies that'll come in, enter the flower, and inside is um, a flap-like stigma that sits down in the throat. And right behind that are the anthers which have the pollen on them. So as the insect comes in, hopefully it's coming from another flower from the same species, and it'll have pollen like on its back, and as it comes in to go after the nectar, it rubs that pollen onto the stigma. And then as it backs out, it lifts that stigma flap up, exposing the anthers, and dusts itself with new pollen to go find a new flower. These guys seem to be obligate outcrossers. They don't self-pollinate or at least they've never done so for me, and I've seen very few records. If you know differently, feel free to let me know. But um, they prefer to outcross, so a different genetic clone has to uh, deposit pollen in here, and this pollen has to go to another plant that is also different genetically. So not just a different plant, because these guys might have propagated themselves clonally, so all the plants around them may be the exact same genetics, but they have to find a different clone, a different population somewhere to produce seeds. Once the flower is pollinated, that falls off, and then the actual ovary will develop into this little circular pod with all these little brownish-black seeds inside that'll um, spread out with the wind and water once they're ripe. Now, those are usually ripe kind of midway to the end of summer, and they have to go through a cold period, a stratification, before they'll germinate. So those seeds will actually sit out in the environment over winter, <clears throat> experiencing the cold, and that cold breaking down the germination inhibitors inside. And come spring, they'll sprout into new plants and start growing. So... Um, the temperate butterworts as a whole are not all that common in cultivation because they are a little more uh, difficult to get growing well compared to the much more common Mexican butterworts or the southeastern U.S. warm temperate species. Um, these guys like to grow in 
<coughs> like the warm tempered species, they like to grow in kind of uh, slightly boggy conditions. You could say much wetter and a lot more organic than the Mexican butterworts tend to like. So a peat based soil mix is good, but a lot of them also tend to grow on rock faces or um, cliffs and so on. So they like a lot of uh, rocky substance or mineral substance within the soil at the same time. So kind of a 50-50 peat to sand or perlite mix or you can add more um, sand and perlite in there for good drainage. Each person's individual conditions may also affect uh, what these guys like best. So uh, if you can, in fact, plant them on like a rock surface that waters down as long as they're in a crack that has some good organic material in there. Uh, that may work well and it would, would also make a really good showpiece. But if you're just growing them in a pot like I am, um, just kind of a mineral heavy peat based mix uh, is best. Plant the plants down in there, they'll take root and start growing. Uh, they need a lot of strong light to do well and at the same time, and this is what is sometimes hardest to do, is they like cool temperatures. If it gets too hot during summer, it can actually trigger these guys to go into dormancy too early. And if they are not given their dormancy period right then and there, uh, the hibernacula will then wake up into a much weaker plant that f then forms a much weaker hibernaculum during the right season, and that is likely to rot out over winter and die. So if these guys go dormant, they have to be given the... Uh, cold period right away. Now for me, I may have slightly too warm temperatures to do really, really well with some of them, and so they do go dormant fairly quickly after growing, so sometimes I will have them awake for three or four months, they go dormant, I'll stick them in the fridge <coughs> for another three or four months, and then wake them up and just have them basically grow through two cycles in a year. If you can, though, it's best to give them just kind of a natural season, though. So in spring, they wake up, have temperatures no higher than, at maximum, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. In fact, they'll do better if throughout summer they're exposed to somewhere between 65 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so they never get really hot temperatures. They'll grow for several months, they'll flower, and then during winter, um, die back to hibernaculum put them into a cold place. Your fridge works. These guys are actually very frost tolerant, so again, they will freeze almost solid in winter in their natural habitat. So if you live in the right uh, climate zones, you could put the pot outdoors and just leave it over all winter long. And then come spring, wake them up again. They're fairly easy to propagate. Again, every year they will produce gemme, and you can kind of separate those out, spread them out, and they'll grow into new plants feed them heavily so that they grow well each year, have enough energy to make a good, healthy, big hibernaculum. And you can also take leaf pullings if you want. You just carefully pull on a leaf, uh, pull it away with the base from the uh, main plant, and then stick that base just into the soil surface, keep it moist, and that'll sprout out new plants as well. So. Again, just because that kind of temperature requirement, they are a little harder to grow than your Mexican varieties or the warm temperate species, but if you can provide those cooler conditions during the summer and you're willing to deal with them basically being in your fridge for four to six months during winter, they can be very rewarding once they start blooming and showing you those beautiful purple colors. So that's about all that I have for you right now for that species. Um, again, as I mentioned by the time you see this I'll be in a new location that uh, relocation has been a bit expensive so every little bit that you might be able to do helps uh, whether that's simply liking and subscribing to the channel and sharing this video around attention helps uh, the channel or if you would like to help support educational materials and get a few exclusive benefits back you can join at our patreon page uh, www.patreon.com slash hcarlton Again, members there get exclusive benefits like access to the uh, seed contest giveaways and early notices for product releases and more. Uh, you can also make one-time donations at coffeeko-fi.com slash Carlton Carnivores. Visit the website, buy some of the plants or some of the resin gem jewelry that I've got there. Uh, other links will also be in the description below. Find me on uh, Facebook and Instagram uh, at Carlton Carnivores for more pictures and videos and other little blurbs, but until next time, I'm Hawken Carlton, and this is Carlton Carnivores. Yeah.